Hey everybody, and welcome to the Eat, Move, Live 52 podcast. Today we're super excited. We have Annie Fenn, who is a doctor in OBGYN, but even more interesting, she is a chef, a she is the founder of the Brainworks Kitchen, a traveling cooking school focused on Alzheimer's prevention, cooking classes, and just all around healthy eating and living to uh, prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease. How exciting is that? We met Annie at Maria Shriver's Move for Minds event in June, where um, we're a part of the audience and we're there rooting for our favorite doctors and speakers on the panel. And you might have seen on our website, we had a little blurb from it. You can actually watch the whole hour and a half panel. It's right linked on our website uh, on Vimeo. And so it was a fantastic event. And I remember meeting Annie and going, we need you on our podcast because you get what actually helps heal and prevent disease. And you went from physician to a chef. Hats off, we need you on the podcast. So she's here now. It's taken us a couple of months to put us all in the same country and the same time zone. Um, But it's so exciting to have you on, Annie. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was really fun meeting you guys at Move for Minds. So cool. So can you tell a little bit about how you went from being an OBG to a chef? Because I can't imagine either transition, chef to OBG or OBG to chef, happening randomly. (laughs) Well, you know how when you just start doing things that you're passionate about and things just happen? That's sort of what happened to me. I practiced obstetrics and gynecology for over 20 years, and I live in a small town in Wyoming. I live in Jackson Hole, and for part of that time, those 20 years, I was a solo practitioner, so I delivered a lot of the babies around here. Um, was had a very hectic, very busy practice. And then um, at one point, I just felt like I wanted to retire and do something else. Um, the lifestyle, the, the, the practice was great and I loved it, but the lifestyle is really unhealthy for physicians in terms of sleep and food and not getting enough exercise. Mm. And I wanted to spend more time with my family. So I retired six years ago and I just started writing about food because I've always been really into cooking and health and nutrition and creating recipes and cooking for friends. And I've always attended culinary schools in my free time when I travel. Um, And that led to a website that I launched called Jackson Hole Foodie, which is basically a recipe blog. And I did that for a while, ended up having a newspaper column every two weeks. Talk about back to the real world job, right? Yeah. And so uh, I started a newspaper column, started writing for magazines, and I was covering a lot of the um, food culture around here, um, but I was always reading my medical journals and staying up on my medical interests, especially longevity and healthy aging. And so when I came across some studies a few years ago that looked at how food can prevent Alzheimer's, it really got my attention. And I thought, wow people need to know about this. This is what I need to be writing about because I need to get the word out. So that's kind of how Brainworks Kitchen came to be. That's so cool. And what an organic process. No pun intended. You know, it's (laughs) so, so beautiful how just one passion leads to another. But it seems like you really kept your interest focused on what would have been your patients if you're a different kind of doctor, but really interested in helping people. Yes. And the whole time I was practicing, too, um, you know, doctors don't learn much about nutrition in medical school. We basically don't learn anything about nutrition. Um, So when I was practicing, I always had this side interest in what people were doing with their lifestyle and how that was affecting their health. And I had this gut feeling that it was very impactful. And so it was really great when this started to get studied systematically. Mm -hmm. And now we have tons of data about how what we eat and how we live can affect our brain health and so many other factors in our life. And it's so hopeful because it's such a daily investment in that that we all make. It's extremely hopeful. And I think that's one of the best things about it. Yeah. Um, You know, Annie, I'm curious, as you know, you're a doctor and you've been studying this stuff for a while. 
And you're also familiar with some of, in talking to you, you're familiar with some of the other types of, you know, diseases that are influenced or caused by nutrition and activity and lifestyle. Like, is there controversy about, like, the causes of Alzheimer's disease or whether diet can influence it? Or is it pretty much, is, is, is it means, gone mainstream? No, this is absolutely um, a hot area of research, which means it's controversial. I mean, nobody really knows what causes Alzheimer's disease when it comes right down to it. Um, the simple answer is it's caused by two proteins that we can identify that get deposited in the brain. One is called beta amyloid and the other one is called tau. And most of the drugs that have been developed over the years are targeted at reducing the deposition of these proteins. Um, and of course, you know, drug failures have been horrible because, you know, after millions and millions of dollars being spent in hundreds of clinical trials, we still don't have an effective drug for Alzheimer's disease. I mean, we only have five FDA approved drugs and none of them actually work very well. So um, what happened to sort of shift the thinking on Alzheimer's was, um, you know, just a few years ago, the National Institute of Health came out and looked at all the data on prevention. And back in 2010, they said that there was no evidence that we could prevent Alzheimer's, no evidence whatsoever. And then in their 2016 consensus statement, they basically did a total flip. And they said that we need to start focusing on finding ways to prevent Alzheimer's, along with trying to find a cure, that's still important, but the shift is in prevention now, which is amazing because now the NIH, if you go to their website, there's dozens of studies looking at all these different lifestyle factors, like how we eat, um, what kind of exercise we do, our sleep patterns, our cognitive reserve, all of these things are being studied systematically um, to see how they can affect our risk of Alzheimer's. So it is controversial because it's all kind of new. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that also makes it more exciting. It makes it more exciting and there's new data coming out every day. But when it comes to the food part, the nutrition part, I'm mostly excited about because it has the best data behind it. We've actually got good, solid scientific studies and a lot of them that show that certain foods and a certain pattern of eating can prevent your risk of Alzheimer's disease. Can you speak a little bit specifically about what those are? What are the patterns and what are the foods? Well, I like to talk about dietary patterns. I don't like to, I don't like to tell people to go on a diet. I don't even mm -hmm. like that word. I think mm -hmm. it's a horrible word. Mm -hmm. um, so studying patterns, which, which means that you can, create your own way of eating within a certain system. Mm -hmm. And the Mediterranean diet, which you're familiar with, Galina, we were just talking about being from Bulgaria, um, has been the most studied dietary pattern. And it's always been associated with longevity and reduced risk of heart attack and stroke specifically. So now we have studies that show that it also prevents Alzheimer's disease. And some of the best studies we have look at MRIs of the brains of people who start eating a Mediterranean diet after eating a standard American diet, or what we call the SAD for many years. Once they switch to a Mediterranean type diet, they actually increase their brain volume in just three years. Wow. That's it's quite... really cool. And we also have the technology now to look at brains, which we didn't have years ago. So that's also going to accelerate research. And that's such a game changer for Alzheimer's research, especially in the last three to five years, is the uh, the technology and looking at amyloid and how it builds up in the brain through wow. pet, PET scans. So they're looking at brain volume increasing. Are they also seeing less plaque or is plaque irreversible? Well, that's very controversial, whether or not you can um, clear up the plaque. Um, mm -hmm. some, some people do think that it's reversible, but um, it's, it has not yet been proven that you can reverse Alzheimer's disease. There are protocols out there that are being studied. Um, there are two things they're looking at with brain imaging. One is brain volume. You know, it's a fact of life that as we get older, our brains actually shrink. It's kind of like when we exercise and our muscles get bigger and we stop exercising, and our muscles get smaller. Um, the same type of process happens with the brain. And with Alzheimer's disease specifically, the hippocampus, which is the area of the brain at the base where we house our short-term memories and our personalities and a lot of our emotion, the hippocampus is what shrinks first in Alzheimer's. Mm. So MRIs can look at that. 
And then there are specialized scans that are PET scans that look at beta amyloid, and they call it the beta amyloid load. So another really cool thing that's been discovered just in the last few years is that people start to accumulate amyloid in their brain starting at midlife. Wow. So we can start prevention when we're 30, you know? Exactly, exactly. That means there's a a window of opportunity that's decades long that you can have an impact on whether or not you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's later in life. They say that they can detect amyloid 20 to 30 years before the onset of symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Very cool. So would you say that eating for Alzheimer's disease would be similar to eating for heart disease or to prevent metabolic disease? Since the Mediterranean diet is associated with so many other um, kind of diseases of, of aging and modern lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about it is there's so many overlaps with other disease processes that we know more about than Alzheimer's. But when I devise my BrainWorks cooking class curriculum, I look at a handful of studies. One is the Mediterranean diet. The other one is a study out of Rush University called the MIND diet or the M-I-N-D diet. Um, The MIND diet is basically the, the Mediterranean diet that was tweaked to be specifically brain healthy. So, so what are the what are the changes between like the what we would think of as the standard American diet and the mind diet? Well, the mind diet breaks food down into ten brain healthy food groups and five brain unhealthy food groups. And I can go over those with all of you. But the um, the amazing thing about the mind diet is they looked at over eight hundred participants, and these are dementia free people. These are healthy middle age people who are in their fifties, sixties, and sometimes their early seventies. So they have no diagnosis of Alzheimer's. They followed them for five years, and they they scored them as to how well they adhered to the MIND diet. And over five years, those that followed the diet most strictly had 53% less Alzheimer's disease. That's exciting. Yeah, I mean, nothing's ever shown that before. No drug, no intervention, no supplement, nothing. And the really cool thing about the MIND diet that I love going back to this whole thing about diets is that, you know, no one sticks to a diet hundred percent. Right. No. So the people that cheated on the mind diet, like those that adhere to it, maybe half of the time, they still had a 37% reduction in risk. Wow. So it was like the hundred percent cheaters that didn't get any change. <laughs> <laughs> so they... they did not fare so well. Another yeah. great thing about the mind diet is not only did they reduce the risk of Alzheimer's, they also improved their cognitive function over time. Yeah. Wow. Well, how stimulating is that? You know, we've been talking with Roland for a long time that, you know, there's a little bit in the health and fitness and wellness world that's so oriented around looks. And there's so much in movement and nutrition that's actually benefiting our our experience in life and how we our quality of life. So things like cognition and energy and your motivation levels, and your creativity, those things are so much more exciting for quality of life than, oh, I lost five pounds. Exactly. And it's such a win-win. You know, if you pay attention to eating brain-healthy foods and staying away from the brain-unhealthy food groups, not only are you reducing your risk of dementia later in life, you're improving your quality of life right now by improving your mental clarity, your cognition, your processing speed, your memory, People sleep better, and they have healthier metabolism, too. I am totally sold. So can we start with the bad guys? Can we start with the bad guys first? What are, like, the the five groups or types of foods that are brain-unhealthy foods? Well, we can you can probably guess what the first one is. Sugar. Um, well, not not so much because they're looking at food groups rather than so fast uh, food? ingredients. Fast food and processed food, which yeah. is basically fat and sugar and unhealthy yeah. oils, right? So fast food and processed food. And the thing about the mind diet is it doesn't really tell you that you can't have this ever. I mean, it doesn't really say that you can't go to McDonald's and get a burger, you know, once in a while. It's not draconian like that. I think that's why people were able to follow it. But they do give you guidelines. Like mm-hmm. they prefer that you don't eat fast or processed food more than a couple times a week. That's pretty loose guidelines. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Food, really? Yeah, right. <laughs> But processed food, you know, there's just so much processed food in people's kitchens and in their cupboards. 
that I find that when I teach my students um, how to revamp their pantry, um, that's a process to get rid of the processed yeah. foods creeped into your life. One of the things that happens to us when we do kitchen makeovers is, okay, now we have bags and boxes full of this processed stuff we're taking out of your kitchen. Who do we give it to? I don't want to donate <laughs> this stuff to anyone. To you worst enemy it's like find your worst enemy i and, know and, and give them these compost. cake these cake mixes and oh we do have worms now we could take we have a worm composter so i guess we could save it all and, and feed our worms yeah it's like you don't even want to give it to the pig farmer do you i love no. our boys i, don't, I, I didn't, hope our worms don't i didn't even want to give them those bad strawberries the other day you know it's like i feel <laughs> bad for the boys i don't want these were tasteless i don't want our worms eating those yeah and most food banks won't take that stuff anymore yeah yeah hmm. so when when you go through your kitchen revamp process, you you were mentioning that it takes you a while to be able to replace those foods with your clients. It's true, and it's taken a while in my own home. I have two teenage boys, and I started doing this, you know, about five years ago um, when I started learning about all this this research. So you know, we got rid of the chips, and we got rid of the tortillas, and we got rid of a lot of the things that have white flour, like I don't use white flour in my kitchen anymore. Um, I don't use refined sugar. There are a lot of things that I've just sort of replaced and weeded out. And, you know, I did it slowly so that it wasn't such a shock to their, you know, teenage systems. But um, we mostly snack on nuts and nut butters and fruit. And we eat, they love hummus, thankfully. eat a lot of hummus. Um, and you know, every once in a while they'll bring home something that I consider junk and I try not to make a big deal about it. Yeah. We try to not make a big deal out of it at home either, but I think with Roland, he was very practical with his kids and just had them, if they wanted something, just walk and buy it. And that completely demotivated them. It's like, I'm not <laughs> uh -huh, walking exactly. for a donut. Like, I'm like, here's some money. Go ahead and go out, walk across the street and get the donut if you want it. And they're like, oh, exactly. Never, never mind. And the kids have an allowance. They're like, yeah. never mind. I'm not buying that, but you have allowance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. So fast food and processed food is, is a big one. Okay. Um, the next one is meat. And the Mind Diet doesn't say that you shouldn't eat meat, but they would like you to keep it up under four servings a week. And a serving size is three ounces. So the size, roughly the size of a deck of cards. Yeah. So that's still pretty liberal because it's not like don't eat any meat. And I know it's tough and right. controversial with meat because nobody's really studying wild caught fish and, you know, responsibly grown pastured beef. Um, right. You know, what's in studies is pretty bad processed meat. Exactly. You have to look at, you know, when they do these studies, they're really designed for large populations of average Americans. So they're not going to say you can have meat, but just make sure it's grass fed beef. You know, yeah. there's a lot of people in America that won't really understand that distinction. But I think it's important. I live in Wyoming and, you know, meat is pretty much part of the culture here. But we we hunt. So we when we do eat meat, it's usually wild game that my husband or my sons have have harvested or it's grass fed beef from ranchers that I know. Yeah. And, and what a privilege that is, um, because then, you know, you're eating your four servings a week and and then they're really nourishing instead of them taking away from you exactly and the whole thing with the having it be primarily grass-fed is that there's more omega-3 fatty acids in the meat because it comes from the conjugated linoleic acids that's in the grass and mm -hmm. the forage that the wild animals eat so a lot of our processed meats or industrially produced meats have a higher ratio of omega-6 fatty acids yeah. which are which are thought to be very inflammatory. Yeah. And Alzheimer's now, it's all about chronic inflammation. It's There's all these pathways that we think cause Alzheimer's, and chronic inflammation seems to be the common denominator. Yeah. So we need to get rid of all those inflammatory components in our food system. Yeah, absolutely. And then that'll benefit cardiovascular health and metabolic health and pretty much every every disease related to inflammation and what's not related to inflammation. Exactly. Um, so that's why I say it's a win-win, but it's interesting with Alzheimer's that people are really worried about um, dementia. And so I find that I've had more inroads helping people eat better by doing it from a dementia prevention viewpoint yeah. than any other way I've tried to teach people how to eat. 
weight, well, whether know, they've been pregnant or, you know, like reducing obesity or diabetes. Dementia is just a, a huge fear for so many baby boomers, especially. Well, I think people, right, oh, if I get diabetes, I'll just take care of it. Like, I'll, I'll, I can yeah. always reverse that. But, like, like, you get really, like, what if you get dementia and you don't even have the, the mental facility, faculties, mental faculties to, uh, to, to even want to try? You know, exactly. And, and, and then it's too late. It's like a one way street. Well, and everyone, and, too late. and everyone knows some, someone who had dementia and, and there's something very scary about losing your personality and losing who you are. Whereas, you know, oh, I'm going to be pregnant, maybe a little bit heavy. Maybe my baby will be a little bit heavy. Yeah, that's fine. You know, the kid, babies are right. cute. Babies are cute when they're heavy. Um, but right. you, I'll just lose that weight later. <laughs> just lose that weight later. My mummy tummy, I'll lose it later. You know, there's all these other moms who do it together, do stroller strides or something. But it, there isn't a sense of losing your identity as we do with, with dementia. So you might be onto something there that eventually as our lives get get longer and we become more interested in quality of life later on in life. You know, I have clients who are in their 70s and 80s who want to climb mountains. Oh, so, that's fantastic. So they want to make sure that they have everything on board that they're going to need. That might be way more motivating than looking a certain way. Right. And the yeah. fact is that, you know, as a population, we're just all getting older and the baby boomers are about to enter these older age groups in record numbers. Mm -hmm. So more and more people know someone who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or they're yeah. seeing it in their family, their aunts and their uncles. So it's becoming a real thing for yeah. people that are at midlife. Yeah, absolutely. So what's number three? Pastries and sweets. Oh, man. Oh, I know. Um, up to five servings a week. And a serving size is, you know, it's like a small thing. Like a small you should see size. our faces. I wish this was a video cast because we, <laughs> we, we both look like cartoons, you know, it's like, like, hard as that. like big eyes and like, I don't think I have pastries five times in a year. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. The last. But, um, <laughs> but some people eat day. cookies every day. They eat sweets every day. So what I do in my cooking classes, I have the best job in the world. I get to revamp all my favorite recipes, like chocolate chip cookies and and cakes and things like that, and revamp them with brain healthy ingredients and make them even more delicious. Oh, so so I've I've largely replaced a lot of the butter that I bake with with olive oil, and a lot of the sugar I've I've cut way back on. And I don't use white flour, like I mentioned. I use nut flours because um, they're so much more nutrient dense, have a better glycemic index. So um, that's part of the fun of the of the BrainWorks cooking classes. Mm -hmm. mm. You really get to play well, with maybe it. Maybe if you have something you could share with us, maybe you could uh, send us a link to one of your favorite easy, simple, and healthy recipes of some sort okay. of uh, yeah, that and we can we'll... have our people replace. And we'll share it with our readers. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. Very, cool. very cool. So, the next one's kind of a tough one for some people. Alcohol. alcohol. But, but not, no, not alcohol. <gasps> There's good news about alcohol. But butter. Butter? Butter. But it's and margarine. But, but do people eat margarine anymore? I hope not. I think some people who haven't had a television or a newspaper or, <laughs> or contact with the internet in the last 30 years might still be eating margarine. I can't margarine. believe it's not butter. I mean, there's still yeah, a lot yeah. of it at the grocery store. And even so now they have those butter blends that are like olive oil butter blends, but yeah. it's technically butter and margarine. But the but the requirements, the the guidelines are less than a tablespoon a day. Oh, that's not bad. That's well, not butter, bad. I would say, hopefully less margarine. But I mean, I, I mean to be fair, a lot of these margarines are horrendous. Yeah, they're really bad. At least they don't. I mean, at least most of them don't have the the partially hydrogenated hydrogenated oil anymore, since that's mostly right. illegal. But or uh, or or they're too embarrassed to put it in there because they have to have a big label on it now. Yeah, but... any artificially produced fats, I think people need to stay away from. I think one of the biggest problems with our diet in this country is all the unhealthy fats that are in our food system. Yeah. I'm so surprised that butter is a part of that because I can see margarine and things like canola and industrially processed, processed and produced manufactured oils but butter is a natural product and i wonder why it's in there. and i wonder why too and you know when i teach my students we can take our knowledge of what we know about nutrition and take it a step farther so i recommend that they buy grass-fed butter because mm -hmm. of the same thing with meat it's going to have right. more omega-3 fatty acids mm -hmm. um and also you know the thing with butter i think is that 
it's high in saturated fat. And so it leads to, it's a lot of calories Mm -hmm. and obesity is associated with Alzheimer's disease. Elevated blood cholesterol is associated with Mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. And Americans eat a lot of butter when it comes right down to it. Well, it's easy to eat a lot of butter when you go to a restaurant and they give you those rolls for free. We don't get (laughs) anything for free in Eastern Europe. Nothing is free. I think maybe like one cube of ice (laughs) you get free. There's no, not even water is free when you sit in a restaurant. You have to pay. Oh, you want water? Okay. It'll be $2, you know? So I've spoken, so I've spoken to, we have a friend, Dr. Spencer Nadolsky, right? And he, and he and I have actually had a discussion about why butter is typically they recommend to reduce it. Okay. And it's because uh, for two things. A, if you're going to have, if you're limiting fat anyway because of the calorie restriction, it, um, olive oil is a safer bet or avocado oil, mm-hmm. something with more mono yes. and saturated fats is a safer bet because those actually actively do things to reduce inflammation where saturated fat is more like a neutral Mm-hmm. At, best, at best, right? Okay. So I'm in then, total agreement. And yeah. I actually love to talk about the foods you can eat more than the ones that you can't. Because okay, we'll once you start getting into stuff. those yeah. foods, then you feel like you don't really need so much butter. Yeah, I mean, it's a, like, there's a huge part of like where your displ- good foods can really like, it's a displacement. It's not just dis- a displacement. Displacement, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And uh, um, yeah, so so to finish up with the saturated fat thing, the, the, the butter is that. Um, a, people have a tendency, once they start having the butter, to really go hog wild with the butter because it's uh, it's hyper palatable, mm-hmm. right? Where olive oil mm-hmm. is not hyper palatable. I never drink olive oil out of the <laughs> bottle, but I do eat we'll butter a, out a, of the with stick. A, with, a, with a spoon or a knife or a fork, it's like a... You know, if you could grill butter, you would, oh, right? Totally. Yeah. Exactly. But don't, so, don't get me wrong. I love butter, and yeah. I'm a baker, so it was really hard for me to change my baking habits. Um, but baking with olive oil gives such great results as well. And sometimes I'll use a combination of butter and olive oil. It's really moist, too, baking with olive oil. Mm-hmm. It really yeah. is. But think about all the butter in foods, like like you were saying, at restaurants. Mm-hmm. It's just so easy to pile it on, and it's calories, and it's fat. And um, we could be eating a healthier fat instead. Totally. Basically. Totally. So what are the good ones, the good oh, wait, guys? So there's one more. And this is, <gasps> there's this, one more? You might not be happy about this one. Coffee? Uh, no, no, coffee's good. Oh, Stop giving um, her ideas. <laughs> cheese. <gasps> no. For the same reason as the butter, probably. Pretty much. Less than an ounce a week. What? These are the Mind Diet guidelines. Less okay. than an ounce mm-hmm. a week. Mm-hmm. Roland, Baby will be, steps. Roland will be fine. I'm going to need to go to a, a, a convent for That's a an, while. Ounce of each, <laughs> an ounce of each type of cheese or an ounce of cheese total? Um, well, they don't go into what type, you know, this is sort of, you know, it's just sort of for the average American guidelines, but we can, we can take what we know about nutrition and, and tweak it a little, right, like right, in Mediterranean right. cultures, they eat a lot of hard cheeses like Parmesan Reggiano, yeah. like pecorino, things like that. And cheese is eaten differently over there. It's, it might be a small portion that you have for dessert mm-hmm. after a meal. Mm-hmm. Um, like they don't bring out the cheese and crackers before dinner. no. <laughs> they don't do that. Americans do that. With, think of with all the jam. cheese that's smothered on food in America. Casseroles. Casseroles. It's it's hard to go to some restaurants without getting things smothered with cheese, like a Mexican yeah. restaurant or Italian restaurant. And again, restaurant. and again, the cheese that we tend to eat here, we buy uh, grass-fed cheese or we buy raw milk cheese. Uh-huh. Um, and then we buy we tend to buy cheese that's extremely flavorful, so we don't have to eat as much of it. Exactly, so, and that's what I do too. I am. Um, I love cheese. I especially love artisanal cheeses and very special handmade cheeses. But I have to say, it's more of a special occasion food now than it used to be. You know what's stunning about the culture here is that you take cheese like brie or camembert, which is already really um, rich, and mm-hmm. and and they put jam on top of it, and then they bake it, and then they serve it with crackers. And it's like you just took something that by itself probably wouldn't have taken you down the rabbit hole of inflammation, but now you're going down and you've made it hyper palatable by putting 
the sweetness and the nice yeah. flavors well, and so the in crunchiness. this case like which is the problem is it the cheese or is it the <laughs> do you see how we're trying to defend cheese here in defense yes of or is it the quantity is with the... which we pile it on you or know or is it all the other stuff in the is it the in this case the baked brie coated with jam and served with crackers you know and then overindulged as well so it's a, it's a huge it's a combination of all these things it's easy to overindulge all right so let's talk and about what is great point. let's talk about what's recommendation because okay, we're so going to be excited the 10 brain healthy food so they divide it into these 10 brain healthy food groups and then i have a few more that are just sort of annie's brain healthy additions okay but but berries great. berries are its own food group in the mind diet Perfect. She's doing and, a great dance over here. And the reason for that is berries are the most potent of all the fruits in terms of how many antioxidants they have, especially the anthocyanin pigments. So the every every pigment and every different colored berry is a different type of anthocyanin. So and the anthocyanins are particularly brain protective because they help clear up amyloid plaque from the brain. So those are all those purpley, red, purpley colored pigments in there. All the different pigments. So it's good to eat, like blueberries get a lot of attention, right, as being the poster child for Alzheimer's eating. But blueberries are great. They're very high in anthocyanins. But you want to get a variety. You want to get all the different anthocyanins. You want to get so the blueberries, cool. the blackberries, the raspberries, the cranberries, um, all the blue, black, red, purple berries. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And the guidelines are at least a half cup twice a week, but I recommend eating berries at least a half cup every day if you can. So cool. All right. That's what? easy. Who doesn't like berries, right? Yeah. I can totally do that. I'm going to need to reduce my consumption a little bit to half a cup. But number two. Number two. <laughs> no, you can have more than a half a cup. That's okay. Awesome. Um, number two is nuts. Oh, good. That's easy. Yeah. Love nuts. So nuts have mostly mono unsaturated fats, which are the most brain healthy fats. It's also the fat that's in olive oil, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But nuts are extremely brain healthy. So in the BrainWorks kitchen, we make nut milks, and we use it to replace dairy for drinking and cooking and things like that. Um, we use nut flours like almond flour, hazelnut flour, chestnut flour to bake and to thicken soups and stews. We snack on nuts. Um, nuts are super important. So awesome. We Wait. love nuts. Love it. We love nuts. And walnuts especially are very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Just Almonds are especially high. Pistachios are good. They've got a green pigment that has some anthocyanins in it as well. And you know, walnuts look like little brains. They do look like they little look brains. They like little brains. I know. They're so cute. They're I so know. cute. They're they... going to be heart healthy too. Even just supplementing a handful of walnuts a couple times a week reduces your risk of having a heart attack. So cool. When I was little in winter, our winter snack was walnuts dipped in raw honey. Oh. And my mom would just stick a whole bunch of walnuts in front of me and, and a, a little plate of honey to dip them in. And she would say, here, eat those for your brain. The <laughs> mom was way ahead of I her time. I know. So I yes. grew up with that. And she would say, they look like little brains. See, you have to eat them. I was like, okay. So <laughs> submit. What do you do? All right. Exactly. And what is so nuts number? is easy, right? Yes. Um, what is number four? Beans is the next one. Okay. Beans. And beans, beans is tough because some people love beans, and but then there are people that just absolutely hate beans. But beans are a superfood in pretty much every culture that's associated with longevity, like all those blue zones countries. Mm -hmm. Beans are really important part of the diet. You know, do you count legumes in there too? Because I really like split peas. Yes, beans, legumes, split peas. Okay, great. And two half cup servings. Um, I'm sorry, one half cup serving every other day is what's recommended. Oh, that's okay. great. That's totally yeah. doable. Great. Yeah, so it's totally great. So I teach people how to cook beans. I, I teach them how to use canned beans, which are just as nutritious. We also cook with chickpea flour a lot. Some people <sighs> just like beans, but chickpea flour has all the nutrition of a chickpea. And so good. Great and thing. all of the taste. Roland doesn't like chickpea, so he's bitter. Do you ever make that French bread, the super nice flat bread just made of chickpea flour? Yes, we make soca. So yes, soca. It's so good. In Italy, it's called farinata. Yeah. We make pizzas out of soca. And it's, other, it's like one of these displacement concept too. Mm -hmm. You know, when I teach people how to make soca, the soca is really delicious, and there's so many things you can do with it. But you're also replacing like flour tortillas mm -hmm. or maybe toast or maybe pizza dough that's made with white flour or what you would ever use to make a wrap 
when you make soca, you're you're replacing those things with something that's incredibly nutrient dense. So good. Awesome. Yeah, and chickpea flour. Okay, so I'll have to give you Roland my recipe for chewy olive oil chickpea chocolate chip cookies. Because I don't know anyone who doesn't like this cookie, even All the right. bean haters. I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. It's not too beany. Fine. It's not, it's not beany at all, actually. I made a soup last night that he said tasted like chocolate cake, so I'm sure he's prepared. <laughs> well, it tasted like yeah. a failed chocolate cake. It was good for soup, but it was like, a, it was like what is going on here? Yeah, I, yeah. Used, I used all the leftover roasted vegetables from Thanksgiving and mixed them with spices and coconut milk, and the result was... It looked like cake batter. That was the pro- part of it is a visual thing. So I think if we were eating uh-huh. in the dark, it wouldn't have been as bad. But it just looked like, <laughs> why are we eating? It looked like a combination of cake batter and black bean soup. It wasn't like, good? Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. You, know how black, oh, yeah. you know how sometimes black bean soup is really black? And sometimes like yeah. when you, sometimes it's like kind of grayish. Uh-huh. Like when you've rinsed it too much. Rinse, dump, rinse, dump, rinse, dump one too many times. And you got rid of all the valuable black. And then, and then it's gray. gray bean oh, soup. my gosh. Yeah, yeah, I can only imagine. Almost, it tasted really good. Oh, good. So he's totally ready for the chickpea cookies now. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, the next one is veggies. We all know vegetables are good for us, right? Oh, yeah. And the most important thing I can teach people in BrainWorks Kitchen is to eat the rainbow, which nutritionists have been telling us for years, but not many people really know what that means. The um, All you the different pigments. Skittles. Yeah, yeah, not the Skittles, but all the different pigments and vegetables, just like in berries, are all these different types of antioxidants. There are so many that we haven't even described yet scientifically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot that we know, but there's probably hundreds and hundreds that have not been elucidated scientifically. So if you get a wide variety of vegetables in your diet, and the Mind Diet wants you to have at least one serving a day, um, then it's, it's like flooding your brain with all these antioxidants. So awesome. Awesome. And then the other food group is leafy greens. So in the Mediterranean world, the Mediterranean diet, veggies and leafy greens are lumped together as one food group. But in the mind diet, they separate out leafy greens as its own food group. And they want you to have one serving of that every day as well. That's awesome. Mm, That's good. Well, I've actually, even like with our own eating, I've I've actually been making a more conscious effort to have vegetables but also have some greens. Like I typically have not found greens very satisfying because they're, I don't don't really like salad. So I've been trying to focus on other ways to eat greens just because I think that they're a valuable thing in and of themselves and separate Mm -hmm. separate from vegetables as a whole. And we also Mm -hmm. grow our greens, which are easier to grow than growing actual vegetables. Actual food. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are the best. But leafy greens are the most nutrient-dense vegetables there are. Okay. So good. And the next food group is whole grains. Okay. Mm-hmm. Which is surprising for some people. Yeah. Because, we, you is know, it... I think we have vilified grains so much. I recently had a farro salad, and it was so good. I was like, oh, I should make this more. And I love cooking with farro, and I love introducing it to students because a lot of times – People haven't had an intact grain. They don't know what it tastes like. They've only had refined grains. Mm-hmm. And people are like, what is this thing? We were at um, a book signing recently at a farm at Doniga's yeah. book signing, and there was a, uh, a wheat berry salad. And people would come up to us and be like, what is this thing? It's weird. What are these things? Because they kind of look like little bugs if you don't know what they are, right? It's like, what's well, right, a right. whole grain? Yeah. yeah. Well, people consider gluten to be inflammatory, and it is for some people. You know, 1% of the population has celiac disease, and they definitely can't eat anything with gluten. And then another 5% of the population has a gluten sensitivity issue. Um, but, you know, the other 20 or 25% or so people that are gluten-free, um, they're doing so more as a lifestyle choice or because they've got some sort of unidentifiable problem with their belly mm-hmm. when they eat gluten. So it's inflammatory for them. So I think a lot of that comes from, you know, most of the gluten that Americans eat, at least 99% of it comes from processed white flour Mm -hmm. and products made from that. Mm -hmm. It's unbound. It's just, it, it, it's sort of torn down to these tiny little pieces that can permeate your body in a completely different way than a whole grain that you've chewed. Exactly. And it lacks the vitamin E 
that an intact grain has, and that's one of our most powerful antioxidants for the brain. So we do a lot of cooking with whole grains, and the Mind Diet recommends one half cup three times a day. So I teach people how to make farro breakfast porridges. Um, we count quinoa as a grain, even though it's a seed. Um, I teach them how to make big batches of whole grains, you know, when they're cooking on weekends, and then they can heat it up for for quick meals throughout mm. the week. Um, yeah, we we even use quinoa to make breakfast puddings and mm. some other yummy things like that. Yeah, how awesome. cool! Yeah. All the right. next one is the next one is chicken. Any, oh, chicken's not meat. Any approved? Chicken's not meat. Okay. Um. So previously, to, when you talked about so week, previously when you talked about meat, you were talking about red meat. I was talking about red meat, chicken and poultry. Okay. Uh, that, so it includes duck and you know whatever else is under that. We eat a lot of wild birds ostrich. here. Ostrich. <laughs> Maybe ostrich. Um, and they don't they don't say what kind of chicken you should choose, but but we know that you know pesticide residue um, is very bad for the brain. It causes oxidative stress on the mm -hmm. brain. So you want to try to choose organic chicken if you can, hormone and antibiotic free, and preferably raised in an ethical situation, yeah. um, which is really hard. It's a very small percentage of chickens that are actually raised that way in America. Yeah. It is hard. Yeah. yeah, it is hard. And then it's hard when one of those chickens might cost between 30 and $40 and you have a family of four. So, you know, it's, it gets really expensive when you start choosing good meat and good chicken. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, not everyone can raise chickens. And What's it's ironic complex. is it ironic it's a, it's too bad that like the the difference between a regular chicken and a really healthy chicken is like can be like five to eight times the cost versus conventional beef versus grass-fed pasture raised is like maybe twice as much yeah so right it's like such a huge so i think it's really the it's the market you know the the market for because grass-fed beef used to be much more expensive, and it's come down as more and more as it becomes more and more uh, pretty popular and produced again. So hopefully the market for chicken will do the same thing. We have a friend out here, Audin Temecula, who has a uh, who has a what do you call it? A pasture-raised mm -hmm. chicken uh, farm. Chicken farm, and you get eggs and chickens and pigs, all sorts of things from them, and uh, they do a great job. But and the the prices have come down as he gets bigger and bigger, and he gets more of a commitment from people to actually buy the animals. So it's great. Yeah, I think the prices will come down. And it also gets back to that concept of when you look at red meat, especially, we should be eating less meat, but we should be eating higher quality meat. Mm -hmm. And we should expect to pay more for the meat that we eat mm -hmm. because there's so many resources that go into it and raising an ethical, you know, and an, raising animals ethically costs a lot more money. Yeah. Um, most of the chicken that people eat in America is fried. Yeah. That's so sad. And it's nah. mostly in fast food outlets. Nuggets. So you just dial it back and say, no fried chicken. You know, maybe once in a while you'll make it yourself or you have a really good version of fried chicken. But to eat that on a regular basis is definitely not good for the brain. Definitely. Or for the environment. All or right. for the environment. So the next one is fish, which we all have heard is yes. fish is brain food, right? It's high in omega-3 fatty acids, which we love. It's a great source of lean protein. Um, and we know like salmon would probably be the poster child for the fishes. But um, the, brain, the really interesting thing about the MIND diet is that they did not show an improvement in reducing Alzheimer's risk after one serving of fish a week. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain, we've talked about this a little bit before, that there's a certain, the, the way we take in omega-3s, DHA and EPA, we take it in and once our body reaches a certain saturation point, it kind of stops being absorbed. It's like stored away into the cells. So we have this certain ratio that's going on, but it's sort of an optimum ratio for us, and then it just stops. So once you get to that point, then... You know, it, it's it's still a great source of healthy protein, and especially when and um, and it can be very cost effective when it's conventional. I mean, uh, like when it's raised or caught uh, in an environmentally conscious way. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, I mean that's why it's like you have enough salmon, which could be more expensive, and then you can have a lots of you can enjoy lots of other fish, even though a lot of many other fish are are not very high in fat at all. 
Right. And the other the other concern with our fish supply is all the toxins mm -hmm. that have seeped into it. So we know that mercury is in a lot of fish, especially the larger predator fish like tuna, wow. swordfish and shark. Mm -hmm. And and they can have a, a detrimental effect on the brain. So there may be this this tipping point where a little bit of fish is good, but a lot of fish is really not so good for the brain. Absolutely. Well, if we go back to the nuts that you talked about earlier, if you uh -huh. make sure that a, a couple of those nuts per week, a few nuts are Brazil nuts. They have a lot of selenium in them. And oh, yes. The Brazil, and selenium has an effect on the absorption of mercury from, from anything but from fish. So fish that have a naturally high level of selenium are much safer and also supplementing with Brazil nuts or some other source of selenium is a great way to make sure that you're not getting this uh, mercury toxicity. Oh my gosh, that's such a great idea. I need to develop a recipe that uses Brazil nuts with fish. <laughs> yeah, that'll be really cool. Do you, Yeah. Did, did we give you, you got our book when we were in, Yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, thank you, so I love you, your book. So if you read the fish, there's a chapter called um, Something Fishy This Way Comes. Uh -huh. And we talked about the Brazil nuts and the selenium. And then there's also a, a link to um, a the Monterey Bay Conservancy, Conservancy that talks about the different, which fish have high levels of selenium compared to, mer to mercury. Mm -hmm. And so those are the ones that are most, uh, uh, the safest ones to eat. And you can yeah, put- Yeah, I, I you... like to use the acronym SMASH. <laughs> mm-hmm. For what salmon, is... mackerel, anchovy, sardines, and herring. Oh, good. Yeah. That's awesome. For brain healthy. For yeah. most brain healthy. Fish. And it's so easy to remember. And sardines are so spectacular. I love cooking sardines. There's... So we do that a lot in the Brainworks Kitchen. We cook with sardines. We cook with anchovies. Um, so good. Yeah, we do lots of fun things with fun and sneaky things with anchovies. You can make like a gremolata with uh, Brazil nuts in it and just put mm -hmm. it on top of your fish. It'll look so good. And it's interesting about selenium too. There was just a very large study looking at selenium and vitamin E supplementation in a group of almost 7,000 men. Um, and it showed that supplementing with those two things do not prevent heart disease or dementia later in life. But when you eat those things in foods, they probably have some benefit. We know the vitamin E does, the yeah. selenium most likely as well. But when you take that, that um, antioxidant out of the food and try to put it into a pill form, mm. it has not been shown to have benefit. That's so spectacular when you see studies comparing the real food to the supplement. It makes me so excited because it's so stimulating to eat the real thing instead of then spending hundreds of dollars every month on supplements that actually don't work. And there actually aren't any supplements that have been shown to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, maybe the exception would be vitamin D. Vitamin D is very important mm -hmm. to have an optimal level. So if you're low on vitamin D, which you would know by a blood test, then you should supplement um, and maybe omega threes. Some people supplement that. The jury is sort of out scientifically as whether that's recommended. Well, you know, they, the 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 one thing that was they they did do some studies. And I think that's in the book too, where they looked at concentrations of omega threes in the blood of people who ate fish versus fish oil capsules, and they found that you don't have to take as much, you don't have to eat as much fish, like. Like the the omega threes that are in fish are absorbed into the body so much better than the than the supplements. So it ends up like where people are like, oh, if you do the math, I have to eat like you know three pounds of salmon per week to get the right amount of omega threes that I get in these uh, fish oil supplements. But it's just not true because your body processes them so much more efficiently and gets to that sort of optimum level and then just sort of levels out. So where, exactly. where the supplements, you'd have to take so much. And then there's just like, it's not, and there's a lot of detriments to taking too much fish oil. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. It kind of com comes to our next brain healthy food group, which right. I think is sort of the secret to the Mediterranean diet is olive oil. Yes. Okay, good. I love olive it. oil. And so I think of olive oil as the perfect conduit for all these antioxidants and all these brain healthy ingredients in our whole foods. And I think that's why the Mediterranean cultures who have a tradition of using just olive oil, really, and not much else in terms of oils in their foods, um, get all the benefit from mm -hmm. what they're eating. Yeah, because that's that's sort of the 
the transportation in through the cell wall and exactly in. it's the conduit exactly that's exactly how i think of it and in the mind diet they like you to have uh, use olive oil as your primary cooking oil great and isn't it nice now like for so many years i used to be so freaked out and wouldn't cook with olive oil because i didn't want to ruin it but right. now I've, I've become way more relaxed with that, with better studies. It's like, okay, I can heat you. It's going to be okay. And if you you can heat, yeah, lower heat, Lower heat cooking yeah. and choosing your olive oil wisely so you don't use your super tasty, delicious, extra virgin olive oil for uh, deep frying. <laughs> exactly. So you have your supermarket olive oil, which um, there are some good brands and some bad brands, but I have a reputable brand that I use. And then there's your, you know, your very special olive oils that you wouldn't heat up at all. Mm -hmm. But I find that the, like the easiest way to clean up people's diets is just get rid of the bad oils in their kitchen. Yeah. Get rid of the safflower oil, get rid of the peanut oil, get rid of the canola oil yeah. and just replace it with olive oil or maybe avocado oil. If you want to fry mm -hmm. something or sear something at a high heat and now there's olive avocado oil blends you can buy at the supermarket, which I really like. Um, they're great for baking. They've got neutral flavor. But olive oil has specific brain healthy ingredients that no other oil has. It has oleic acid, or it's also called oleocanthal, which also helps clean up amyloid plaque in the brain. And tons of polyphenols, which are potent antioxidants as well. So when I was growing up and we didn't have we talked about this before the show a little bit, we didn't have a lot of um access to many different foods. You know, communism is like associated with lack. We all olive oil. We only got olive oil like a couple of times a year, and it was kept in the fridge as medicine. So oh. you weren't allowed to cook with it. Like if you were caught putting it on salad, you'd be in great trouble. <laughs> and so everyone did olive oil lemon shots in the morning. It was like a part of 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 how my family did their natural morning healing ritual. And it was wow. like, this is for medicine. It's not for food. So I've grown up with this reverence for olive oil. Like, yeah. okay, this is medicine. I don't... said, Mom, can't we have our medicine on top of the salad tonight? <laughs> and did you like it? Or did shot? you think it was gross? Um, You know, I, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought it was really good when you do your olive oil oil and lemon shot which i grew up uh -oh. doing you know you just get used to it like you're a kid you don't know anything if you're gonna like, do shots right. i can't think of a healthier one <laughs> yeah. well i love doing olive oil tastings as part of my brain works kitchen classes and i like to teach people how to identify an olive oil that has the most oleocanthal in it how? and like you know you know when you um slurp olive oil like in a tasting in the back of your throat so sort of like at a coffee it's... tasting yeah it should be pleasantly bitter and the bitter, the bitterness is polyphenols. Okay. Cool. So that's what you want. And it's really, really good for people to identify bad olive oil because there's a lot of it around. Mm -hmm. And so there's some that's also hot. It's got kind of like a little, like a peppery taste almost. Uh-huh. Yeah, those are some of the, the most potent ones for your brain. Well, so. We have a friend locally who, who works at an olive oil store. So we're gonna. I think we're gonna go down there and do a little tasting. We should do that. Do yeah. some slurping. Perfect. Just, yeah. Perfect. So there's one more brain healthy food group if, if we have time. We yeah. do. Okay. And um, this this one's sort of a good news bad news one. Um, it's red wine. Okay. Which is the good news if you like drinking red wine, but the bad news is five ounces a day, Ooh. which is a really small glass of wine. I know. But then, but it's every day. But it's like we but don't really day. we don't really drink, so it's like it's actually really a happy thing. Cause it's, it's, so for some people that seems like a lot of wine. For other people that doesn't seem like anything. Some of my but, clients um, drink a bottle a day. They would be very upset if I told them it's only five ounces. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But um, you know, there's a lot of um, you know, special brain healthy nutrients in specifically red wine. But lately there's been more studies out about alcohol and social drinking and whether it increases your risk of dementia or decreases mm -hmm. your risk. Mm -hmm. And what we're finding is that it doesn't really matter what type of alcohol you drink. If you drink it in small amounts and socially with friends and with food, then it actually can reduce your risk of dementia later in life. That's such a big distinction, whether you're drinking because you're in a pleasant social setting and you're relaxed and, you know, your whole digestive system is tuned for digestion and you're you're feeling safe and excited and you're socializing very different from I'm drinking because I'm lonely. 
or I'm isolated, exactly. you know, and we're seeing the studies on loneliness and isolation. And I can, I can only imagine it's impossible to do an ethical study between like lonely and non-lonely people. Yeah, but, loneliness has actually been identified as a risk mm-hmm. factor for Alzheimer's yeah. disease. And then, you know, you can't mm-hmm. really watch and see who dies, but it's, in a way, we have to start looking at the behaviors, not just what we're drinking or what we're eating. Exactly. And the alcohol effect is not strong enough. Like no one would recommend that you start drinking if you don't drink at all. The, the you know, yeah. the beneficial effect on your brain is not that great. But um, like there are some, the only blue zone in America are the the uh, Seventh Day Adventists mm-hmm. in California. Well, the, the California, mm-hmm. exactly. And they don't drink at all. Oh, okay. No. And they and they live to be 100, and they they don't have dementia. But all the other blue zones in the world have alcohol as part of their social and cultural mm-hmm. ritual. Yeah, you go down to Greece, and there's like a local wine for each island, and they're so proud of it. So exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Sardinia, Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. Um, but the social piece is really important, and it's hard to it's hard to separate that out during studies. Yeah. But the most of the good news is with alcohol, most of the news is good, as it is with coffee. Have, you've seen those recent studies come out about oh, coffee and all the antioxidants mm-hmm. and how it reduces the risk of dementia, especially if you drink it black and, mm-hmm. and on a regular basis. So I'm mm-hmm. a big advocate of drinking black coffee. Just I don't like it when people put sugar and dairy in their coffee. I think it, it ruins it. Yeah, it, it becomes like coffee is a raw food, and once it's cooked and roasted it can be so wonderfully done but then it can also be ruined like any food just like we can ruin wheat we can ruin coffee exactly yeah it has been amazing having you on so fun we have so great. a lot that's great and i think um i think our, our listeners can really are really going to enjoy this one yeah, yeah absolutely how can um how can we find out or our listeners find out more about you um, well, I have a website called brainworkskitchen.com, and there's articles there about the background, like, like which studies I use to devise my cooking classes, and there's also recipes. I have tons of new recipes that I learned in Tuscany that I'll be posting in the next few weeks, so I've got lots of new stuff coming up. And then I keep a close eye on the Alzheimer's research and science, so I post updates on anything like that that I think would be interesting to someone who wants to prevent dementia or who might be worried about it very cool so we're going to put that in the show notes so people can have easy yeah. access to it together with if you find a cookie recipe that you want to share <laughs> with your cookie recipe <laughs> do you have any books that you find inspiring for people that are just learning that food might have something to do with how their brain's going to do as they age I do have a couple books I recommend, but the book that I, I want to recommend is the one that I'm writing, and it's not ready yet. Yes, and we're going to so have you is... back when you're done with it. <laughs> Thank you. I would love that. So my my book is basically a, a science-based cookbook that uses really incredibly delicious foods that have been proven to prevent Alzheimer's. So I'm still working on that. That's great. But That's great. one book that I highly recommend is The Complete Mediterranean Cookbook. And this is by America's Test Kitchen. Mm-hmm. You know, the, mm-hmm. you know how yeah. America Test Kitchen, they test all their recipes. Mm-hmm. So you know they work. And it has pretty much the whole gamut of Mediterranean dishes in there. That's a great place to start. I also really like Andrew Weil's True Food Cookbook mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, from his restaurants, his True Food Kitchen restaurants. Yeah. Those are it's delicious. basically an anti-inflammatory diet, which is very similar to the Alzheimer's prevention diet. I love a book called The Healthy Mind Cookbook by Rebecca Katz. Mm -hmm. She's a science-based food writer. She's also wrote The Cancer Fighting Kitchen. I have an in-depth interview with her on my website if anyone's interested. And the other one I love is is The Blue Zone Solution. Isn't that a great book? Love that book. It's a great book. And I love how Dan Buettner just looks at all the common foods that the blue zones all over the world, even though they live in different places and different cultures, they have a lot of commonalities in what they eat. That's very cool. We're going to link all of those in the show notes, too. It's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Annie. It's been we, such an honor to have you on. Yeah, we look Thank forward you. to we're gonna have you back again. We can't wait to, to hear more about that book. Yeah, so oh, great. once your book is up on pre-order, please let us be the first podcast that has been done. Oh, I would love that. It's been such a pleasure to get to know both of you. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us. Okay. All right, take care. Take care of your brain. Thank <laughs> you.
If you like today's show and want more episodes like it, you can help us by rating and reviewing the show wherever you subscribe. That means iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, or in the podcast app on your phone. If you know somebody who can benefit from today's episode, share it right now from the show notes, which you can always find at eatmovelive52.com slash notes. And that funk that's playing behind me, it's called Proto Funk by Kevin McLeod. Thanks and talk to you soon. Oh, my God.